the, the great thing about this collection is that it, it has the works of um, writers that many of you are familiar with. If you're uh, fanatic readers of bird literature, there's Susan Cerulean, there's Katie Fallon, who wrote Cerulean Blues. There's Eli Knapp, who wrote The Delightful Horror of Family Birding. There's Donald Krudzma, an ornithologist who writes about birdsong. So there's people who are established in the, in the birding world. And then there are much younger writers. And so tonight, I have my two youngest writers in, in the collection, um, which I am uh, simply thrilled about. Um, Allison Vilag is coming to us from somewhere in Florida, south of Okeechobee, <laughs> where she spent the day looking at wading birds in caracaras, she tells us. Um, and she uh, is, has been a, worked as a guide um, as um, from it, particularly the piece that's in the collection is uh, in, on the, in the Pribilofs in Alaska. So it, when I read her piece, it was um, simply thrilling. It's a place that I've been to to bird and, and I could, she described it so well, it took me right back there and I was completely taken with her work immediately. Um, and then our, our second, and she went to school in Maine, uh, grew up in the Midwest. Uh, you can ask her more questions later if you'd like. Um, Christina Ball grew up in Westchester County um, and is a, is a bird artist. If you know, if you are a Bird Watchers Digest subscriber, her artwork is on the cover. If you've been to a bird festival anywhere in the country, no doubt you have seen her there selling her artwork. And um, she, she most recently published this, Once Upon a Feather, which is uh, a simply fantastic illustrated look at, at fantastic birds that may or may not exist. Um, so, uh, but more importantly, uh, Christina was my student at Bard College, full disclosure. Um, I showed her her first yellow warbler and that was kind of it. And I've watched her simply take off and make birds and birding her life, uh, whether it's art or, or writing. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm going to really uh, turn this over to my, to my young people. Um, and I think one of the things about having uh, youth in our midst is um, both within the birding community and the writing community is they have sort of fantastic, um, ambitious uh, life goals. And so I, I would, and, and I know that Allison's engaged on a year long project this year, uh, a twist on a big year that, um, so I'm gonna have them talk a little bit about their projects and read to us from their, uh, from their essay within the book. Um, and then we're gonna have a little conversation. I'm, um, I'm very interested in the relationship between the birds and the writing and the artwork and how that all sort of uh, comes together. And so maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. Maybe some of you have some questions as well. There's certainly lots of bird artists and bird writers. Um, I certainly had plenty of marvelous work to choose from when I was putting together this collection. It was just uh, extraordinary, uh, the, the amount of great writing that is out there. So, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna turn out. Do, we didn't talk about this. Who goes first? Would, does one of you want to sort of lead lead off with your? Uh, nobody. Can I, while you're thinking about that, just a quick uh, housekeeping note for everybody out there. Yeah. You go in the upper right hand corner if you're on the desktop. Uh, fiddle around if you're on a tablet. Make sure you've picked the speaker view, and you'll be seeing only the three speakers and seeing them larger. So just a tip on that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, that's that solves a problem for probably a lot of people. That uh, although I like I like seeing everybody sitting out there. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Christina, why don't you lead us off? Tell tell us about your your lifelong project, and then uh, you know read to us a, a few pages from your essay in the collection. All right, sounds good. Um, hey, everybody! So excited to be here. It's always great to see other birders, especially when it's so hard to see other birds. I even dressed up for you all. I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> that were the raccoon tie, which if have you, any of you ever read my story is actually very appropriate because there's a very important raccoon in my story um, that I became very good friends with. And <laughs> um, yeah, so, like, so I was Susan's student. It was one of the best times of my entire life. It was the best class ever. I showed up and we went canoeing and then she introduced me to birds and then 
you know, almost, what are we up to, like nine years later, <laughs> I've done so many crazy things and gone so many crazy places. And I don't know if that would have happened if I hadn't taken your class. So it's been great. Um, and one of the great things besides in being introduced to birds was that I was really encouraged to figure out, you know, how writing also tied together, not only my, my love of the natural world and my, and, but also my art. And then it just all was a wonderful experience to figure out how to, you know, express this emotion here, express that emotion there, this bird there. And some things I think you just really need writing to uh, express in a way that, you know, sometimes it just doesn't happen with art. So um, I figured I would, I would show you a little bit of what I do in my art life before I read you um, a little bit of my, of my story. So let me just see if I can do the technological part of this. I have some pictures to show you because the best thing about being an artist is that you always have pictures to show. Um, or that's not the best thing about being an artist. It's one of the best things about being an artist. Okay, let's see if I can do the thing where I start the slideshow. Why can't I see my thing? Oh, because that's up there. Cool. Sorry, guys. I'm not a very tech savvy person for my generation. Come on. There we go. Okay. So my dream in life, which I kind of figured out while I was at Bard College, was I want to see and paint and draw all 10,000 birds in the world. So uh, I read Ken Kaufman's book, Kingbird Highway, as a junior. And uh, it occurred to me, you know, if he could go and have a big year, and eat cat food and only spend a thousand dollars before eBird, then you know there's no reason why I couldn't go and see every single bird, you know, over a lifetime. So it all just seemed to make sense in my head. And uh, by doing this particular ambitious thing, I've gotten to see some really cool stuff, meet really cool people. Uh, and my my big thing when I'm painting is that unless someone is paying me a lot of money or it is for a very specific commission, I only paint birds after I've seen them because it's really important to me to tell a story in that painting. So it may not be writing in this particular sense, but the story is so important. I wanna really try to capture a bird's personality and, uh, and, like really and try to bring the experience of seeing it to people. Cause I think that's why we go out and bird, you know, that's why we wanna have those experiences. And, I think one of the best ways to get people to want to go out and bird themselves is to just show them how much fun and how awesome birds are. So these are some of the things I did while I was at Bard, while Susan and I were running around seeing fall warblers. I just fell in love with how cute they all were and wanted to snuggle them all up, but I wasn't supposed to. So I painted them instead. And there was this really cool day we were out birding and I saw my first osprey and it hit the water and exploded. And I just wanted to show that awesome moment. So I just wanted to show a couple examples of how, you know, they're not perfectly anatomically correct because we have Ken Kaufman and Katherine Hamilton to do that, but I want to tell you how cool they are with these pictures. <laughs> um, so like the, I think there's something really, uh, you know, as, as birders, we're looking for that amazing, amazing moment. And, and I think that, you know, writing and art is the way that we can bring those moments to other people, especially now when we're all stuck at home and it's really, really hard to go find those moments. You know, looking, I found a lot of comfort reading people's stories and, and seeing people's pictures and just being able to have those out of body moments where I don't feel like I'm stuck inside waiting for, for COVID. And I have been lucky enough to uh, do a little birding. So these are the, the, um, my four most recent birds. I'm up to 1,121. And I think I painted about like maybe four or something, but I really have to get up on that. So I was lucky. <laughs> cute little winter birds, like those red poles, which are adorable. Also things I want to snuggle. And then these are just a couple of pictures from the book Susan showed. Uh, while I was at Bard College, I also took a class about mythology. And uh, because I had to write this really, really intense paper and the professor was just so unbelievably hard, he told us, write a, he told me, write about something that interests you. I was like, okay, well, I like birds. So I'm gonna write to you uh, a paper about Zeus and eagles. And then fast forward a few years later, and it was so freaking cool that I decided I was just gonna write a whole book on birds and mythology because the relationships between people across time, and as birders in particular, I think we really have a, a connection to the natural world that it's amazing to see how people, you know, across all cultures and across all places and across time have just shared. And, and I think seeing these birds in mythology and how they resonated back then and now is just a really cool experience. Um so, yay. um, so today I wanted to, uh, well, I guess, yeah, some more paintings. Um, I wanted to uh, share uh, this painting here. This is the painting I did after I wrote this story. Um, so I'm going to uh, read a couple pages from the beginning. Um, so, uh, my story uh, was about 
the coolest thing that's ever happened to me as a birder. I decided, you know, after, after Ken Kaufman, you know, walked across the North America eating cat food, I figured it was no problem to jump on a plane with no money <laughs> and a backpack and show up in San Francisco uh, and go looking for California condors, uh, since I think vultures are the coolest birds in the world. And, you know, I had to, I had to find the king of them all. So, you know, that was no problem. That's, that was fine. I think my mother's on this call, and at this point, she already knows all about the dangerous things I did, so I can disclose all of, all of, the, all of the craziness. Um, but I decided I was going to backpack from San Francisco, where I got off the plane, uh, down to Big Sur, the, most, the northernmost point I could uh, of their range I could reach the most easily, and with the least amount of expense, and with the least amount of possibility of dying. Um, so yeah, a couple of my, you know, I'm just going to jump into it, and uh, full disclosure, I survived. So did no one panic. All right. One dream, three raccoons, and countless blisters later, I finally find myself looking over the edge of Pacific Highway 1. It has taken a plane ticket that wiped out my checking account. It's taken a plane ticket that wiped out my checking account and a week of chasing down buses to finally get here, but I am overcome with a view that already makes my journey worth it. At the bottom of the 200-foot drop from the guardrail to the Pacific Ocean, waves pummel, pummel the cliffs. Wind buffets the scrubby bushes and hardy flowers that bloom in California in late February. I cannot fathom how they manage to cling to the edge of the earth. The sun strikes the ocean so fiercely that I cannot look past it at the infinite horizon. It is hot, I am sweating, my backpack scrapes into my shoulders and cars are hurtling past me at 60 miles an hour. It is here at the edge of the North American continent that I'm going to attempt to find the king of North American vultures the bird I dream of finding above all others, the California condor. To anyone who has ever seen Disney's The Lion King, vultures are birds that fly around sinisterly, waiting for Simba to die in the wilderness so they can eat him. But to birders like myself, vultures are these incredible creatures that clean up after us humans and keep the world free from a myriad of disease. Although my family thinks that I am crazy, I insist that these bareheaded birds that pee on themselves to keep cool and vomit as a means of self-defense are the most beautiful birds in the world. Naturally, I have to find the most awesome of them all. As a group, birders tend to skew towards crazy. While there are many birders who are content to watch the avian world unfold at a feeder from the comfort of an armchair, there are just as many who could never aspire to such sane bird watching. I say this lovingly because many of my favorite people are the kinds of birders who spend more money on binoculars than they do on rent and call in sick to work in order to wake up at 4 a.m. to drive eight hours to stand for 12 hours, surveying a six square foot patch of marsh looking for a duck that to the average person looks the same as every other duck. In my defense, I was not the person who came up with this plan and furthermore, a gargany has a white crescent eye stripe and silvery, silvery wing feathers that make it quite distinct from your average mallard. That being said, when I jump off the bus at the northernmost point of Big Sur and find myself standing alone on Pacific Highway 1, I cannot help but wonder if I am being too crazy even by birding standards. As a 24-year-old wandering bird artist, I am not exactly in a financial position to buy my way out of trouble or even rent a car, which would have made my week-long logistical masterpiece of bus connections punctuated by miles of walking so much simpler. In case anyone was wondering, it is not easy to get from San Francisco to the northernmost point of the Condor's Rage located in the Big Sur region without a rental car in the middle of February. It turns out that there is only one bus that will be returning from Big Sur to Monterey this week, and if I miss it tomorrow, it will be quite the feat to ensure I can reverse my trip to catch my return flight home to New York State. So after hours of earning extra money to buy my plane ticket and hours of traveling to reach this one spot along Pacific Highway 1, I now have 14 daylight hours to lay eyes on this bird I have wandered so far to find. Still, even the short amount of time to find a California condor is a lot considering that only 30 years ago, the condor seemed doomed to extinction. Although it had existed for over two and a half million years, evolving to survive the ice age and the post-glacial world that followed, humans threatened the condor so that even the possibility of finding one soaring above the skies in Big Sur is nothing short of a miracle. Now alone in its genus, the bird that became Gymnogyps californianus once existed in a Pleistocene world filled with mastodons, brown sloths, camels, and a slew of other giant mammals. It commanded a range that stretched from Canada to Mexico, from the west coast along the Pacific Ocean to the east coast as far as New York. Scavenging condors made quick work of the gigantic carcasses that littered the land, perfectly adapted to a world that required the cleanup of creatures 
as enormous as they were, but the Condor's world was destined to change for the worst. As the Pleistocene megafauna disappeared on the heels of the retreating ice age, the prehistoric birds found themselves surviving into a new era alone. The California condor is a species that cannot adapt fast enough to an evolving human world. Today, the range of the California condor is so reduced that there are very few places I could have found, gone to find it. There are wild populations among, along California's southern coasts from Big Sur to Ventura County and in northern Baja, California. There's also a small population in Arizona in the Grand Canyon. A quick scan of the cliffs in the distance produces a turkey vulture, the smaller cousin of the California condor. Even though it is far away, I can tell almost immediately that it is not the bird that I am looking for. Aside from the fact that I have logged hundreds of hours watching turkey vultures and I know them better than any other bird, I can tell that this bird is too small to be a condor. The California condor is the largest bird in North America and its nearly 10 foot wingspan inspired fear, wonder, and legends amongst the native peoples of the Pacific Northwest. In modern times, the huge bird has been mistaken for a small airplane. There are other raptors riding the thermals created by the cliffs that rise above the highway. And although I take the time to identify them all, I already know that they are not condors. Something within me is sure that the moment I see the giant scavenger, I will know it. Let me stop sharing my screen. Stop share. That was fabulous to hear you read this. Um, and and I'm, I'm struck um, hearing you read how the essay begins as, as so much of our, our birding adventures do. And a lot of uh, what I've read about birds and birding is that it sort of starts off with the, the crazy and the zany and the adventure. And then it comes to this more sobering realization of, of a scarcity of a species or something like that. So that, that sort of emotional back and forth or the glee and the, and the, um, uh, then the more sort of somber realization of, of where we are as a planet, right? That, that texture, like you were saying, that that's not something that you can capture in a painting, right? It's more sort of an explosion of a moment or energy in, the, in a painting and, and a, a, a piece of writing can have, you know, a, a, something that shifts over time, right? Um, that, that you can have all of that within an essay, which is why I love essays so much, really. Um, so I can testify that um, Christina loves, has always loved vultures when she was a student at Bard. I would, if I ever wanted to find her, if she wasn't in her art studio, she was down by the Bard dump where there's lots of black and turkey vultures that hang out and she would be there watching them. And it was a great day in class when she showed up and she said, Susan, they can jump. And I knew exactly what she was talking about. <laughs> So that was great. Thank you very much. So Allison, I, I, my screen's sort of all over. There you are. Um, so Allison, why don't you tell people about the, um, your year-long project, which I really know about only through social media because I follow Allison on Facebook and her adventures and, um, and, and thrilled with what she's doing, at least what I'm hearing of uh, through, the, through, through Facebook, um, which maybe is an antiquated platform, but it, it seems to be uh, still a place where we can find out what, what people are up to. So why don't you tell people about this wonderful project that you're engaged in and then, and then read us from your wonderful essay as well. For sure. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for inviting me to be part of this tonight. I am checking in from a place called Dinner Island Wildlife Management Area in Florida. And I did not know that Dinner Island existed before earlier this morning. And that's part of the beauty of the project that I'm doing this year is I wake up and I don't know exactly where I'm going to go. I just look at the map and we go there and uh, find interesting things about birds and bird conservation. I haven't come up yet with a good title exactly for what I'm doing. Um, I use the term a big year, but it's definitely a very different sort of big year because it is not species oriented at all. I am more interested about bird conservation and sites that are important to bird concentrations and finding interesting stories from those things, especially since this year in 2021, we have the lens of a pandemic and the lens of a very volatile political situation in the US. And while it's not an exactly fun time to live in, it is an interesting time to think about and write about. And I think it's going to be a very interesting project. So. This week, I have been around Lake Okeechobee. The Everglades, of course, are a very, very important area 
for bird populations and I thought that it would be really interesting to start up at Lake Okeechobee and explore the dike and the sugarcane fields that are what now is of what once was the headwaters of the Everglades and we're working our way south and next week at this time we'll be chicky camping on the canoe trail in the Everglades National Park. So that's um, the brief version of what's going on. I'm very excited to see where this year goes. I plan to be living in my vehicle for most of the year and just being around birds and being moved by the things that I see. Um, so far, my favorite bird things about this trip have been watching a caracara take a dust bath two days ago. It was really cool. It was just kicking its legs up in the road and flicking its wings and looked like it was having a good old time. And the other great thing about camping in Florida this time of year is that you hear barred owls every day and we've been doing that. So it's been super enjoyable so far and I am excited to piece the stories together and hopefully create a book at the end of this year. But what I'm going to be bringing to you tonight is actually from when I was guiding on the Pribilof Islands. Those are in Alaska's Bering Sea. And they're not really close to any landmass. They're pretty far from Russia. They're pretty far from the Alaska mainland, but they're a little bit closer to the Alaska mainland than they are to Russia. And there's five islands in that archipelago. If you have ever heard of the show Deadliest Catch, that is that where they process the crabs, but I know most of you are birders, so you probably know the purple offs for other reasons. They are spectacular for breeding seabirds. They have one of the largest nesting concentrations of red-legged kittiwakes in the world, and that's a huge draw, as well as crested auklets and least auklets puffins. Um, they're the biggest northern fur seal haul-out breeding area, and looking at the geology of the island, just so you can put yourself in the scene a little bit better, uh, there's no trees there. There's a lot of volcanic rock, and the vegetation is mostly thick grass that's really hard to walk around in if you're trying to flush birds out of it. I was really fortunate to be a guide there in 2015 and 2016, and guiding out on the Pribilof Islands is probably some of the highest stakes guiding that there is in North America. You have people coming out that are really, really focused on seeing vagrant birds that will have blown in from Siberia. And sometimes they'll come out and the guides and the clients alike don't have any idea whether the birds that they want to see are even in the hemisphere at any given time. So the odds are low and the stakes are really high, but when everything comes together, it's quite rewarding. And that's what I'm going to be reading to you about today. So I'll get right into it. On a day in the last week of June, I was guiding four people, the only clients on the island at that moment, John and Janet, Brit photographers, and Sam and Gail, birders. The other guides had the day off, and it was a good day to have off. Sometimes a group of mixed clients breeds discord. The birders want to scour a slew of sites for vagrants, while the photographers want to sit in one spot for an entire mor morning and take a slew of photos. However, on this morning, there was no such friction. The five of us were united in a common desire to be inside the van. Priblovian weather had driven us off reef cliffs early. It was the sort of day where you spend more time reclaiming your optics from sea spray than you do actually looking through them. We were traveling towards Ridge Wall. This was not because I expected conditions to improve. All of St. Paul's cliffs are a rough time in southeast gales. But because traveling to Ridge Wall, would allow us the longest recovery period before exiting the van to certain cold and misery somewhere else. My body was already sore from shivering, and I was anticipating the evening ritual of savoring a cup of Baileys and hot chocolate from the staff house boiler room. Just outside town, we stopped at Salt Lagoon, an expansive tidal flat that sometimes holds an interesting shorebird or gall. I peered between the raindrops on my binoculars, noting that not even the condensation enhanced the appearance of a glaucous-winged gall. They all still looked various cycles of sorry. I weighed the options. Guides on St. Paul, like workers anywhere, carry a toolbox. Not just physical, lens cloths and spotting scopes and rare birds of North America, but one less tangible. Tools like a soft touch to ease a decrepit 12-passenger van out of a treacherous sand pit. The sense of working with wind, light, and a jack snipe. So the group gets the best views as it flushes how to best console a client whose luggage felt victim to the wiles of pen air. We used to call it wen air. Almost since the season had started, 
Endurance, optimism, and the art of convincingly using time between trident meals had been tools in regular rotation. The fun tools, pin a name on that Asian flycatcher, for example, had not. The winds just had not been with us. We all, guides and clients alike, had been poised and ready, begging for the winds for an opportunity to use our full repertoire. There was so much that we could do, but there was also only so much we could do, for we needed luck, and it was beginning to seem that luck was largely absent this season. On this day, though, we did not recognize it at the time, it was luck that the bad weather had driven us from the cliffs early. It was luck that Gail asked for a scope view of the red leg kitty wakes resting on Salt Lagoon's tidal flats. It was luck that, after setting her up on the kitty wake block, I happened to glance skyward at the right place, the right time. A bird cut over the harbor towards us. Something about it seemed different. I was catching a weird angle, perhaps. Maybe it was a Tringa sandpiper of some sort. A wood sandpiper would always be welcome. I swung my binoculars up and immediately realized my error. The long projection, that naked eye I had assumed to be legs, was actually a tail. It was a swift, one much too large for the expected American species. Swift, I shrieked, get on it, it's Asian. Suddenly, those tools I had been aching to use all migration came into play. I dropped my bins, raised my camera, and fired off shots, as many as I could, before the dark streak could vanish. Dark. That had been the first impression we'd all gotten. Well, whatever it was, it was an ABA bird for me, said Sam. He was speaking for us all. Swifts are aptly named. This one was gone. Evidenced only by my adrenaline shakes in our photos, we bent over the cameras to dissect the identification. There were three possibilities, Pacific Swift, White-throated Needletail, and Common Swift. The first shot showed the underside of the bird. This was black, which meant our bird was not a needletail. I scrolled back through the camera. Thankfully, there was a dorsal view as well. This too was dark. The Swift was no Pacific, the most expected of the three. All dark, all right, it was a common. Despite its name, common swift is anything but, in North America. In fact, at the time, the number of occurrences of this species in North America could be counted on one hand. This all is according to Rare Birds of North America, the only North American field guide where you'll find common swift. In flipping through the pages of Rare Birds, you'll find a lot of common. Red shank, rose finch, cuckoo, sandpiper. So what are they? Common? Rare? That depends on where you are and where you care. If you're someone like Sam, who was birded on Attu Island and devoted much time to chasing down birds inside the ABA area, common swift is a mega. On the other hand, if you're more like John and Janet, the Brit photographers, a common swift is fittingly named. We've got them in our garden back home, they laughed. Where is St. Paul, really? Any map would show it being far from anywhere. The Bering Sea Islands, of which St. Paul is one, are a fringe spot where borders blur. A cursory glance at a map may not reveal which flag they fly. At 200 miles from Alaska's mainland and 500 from Russia's, there is nothing nearby. A map from 2016 would designate the Pribilofs to be property of the United States of America, but a map from the 1830s would have them as Russia. In town is a Russian Orthodox church whose congregation bears Russian surnames. There, Russian and Aleut and English are all spoken. Fourth of July, a decidedly American holiday, is celebrated in decidedly American ways. Beer, a loud parade, and a community barbecue, it all trimmed in red, white, and blue. The birds on St. Paul are a conglomerate too. The common teal subspecies of green-winged teal reaches the eastern extent of its range. The American green-winged teal, the western. Here on St. Paul, they meet, and as it will go on small islands, they mingle producing offspring that, like the community, portray the new and old worlds alike. But to an ABA lister, it's pretty clear. St. Paul is definitively, albeit barely, inside the ABA area, a volcano-made island in a man-made construct. Listers tend towards the limits of this regulation area, southeast Arizona and Newfoundland and the Florida Keys. At places like these, birds extralimital show up from time to time. Extra limital, a visiting birder had mused earlier that spring. I love the word. It conjures being in the right location in the right place at the right time, when the alchemy of wind and El Nino and the season finally works itself out. This day, finally, 
After a season of winds from the wrong directions, the alchemy had come through. Though the swift was long gone, we had some time yet before Trident would have lunch out. It was back to the guide's toolbox, back to the art of convincingly using time. We continued on to our original destination, Ridge Wall, where we would watch the crested auklets and red leg kittiwakes and red faced cormorants. These species, to the international birder, constitute the marquee birds of the Pribilofs. They are birds absent from most of the world, yet abundant on St. Paul. What is common? What is rare? That was just wonderful to hear you read. It's such a great essay. And, you know, I, I, I teach the essay, I write the essay, and I think probably what I love most about it is exactly what you're doing here and what Christina does as well so beautifully is that that movement of, you know, we're in the moment and we're seeing this swift and then suddenly you're thinking about it, right? So there's this, there's this great texture to the essay where it's sort of, um, there's moments of thinking and thinking about that, you know, what, what's, what is common, what is rare, and then um, being in the moment in the field with the guide who's trying to figure out what to do. Um, so I, I think um, we, we can open it up for questions soon, but I, I, I sort of, because, because a lot of putting together this book was I, I started birding 10 years ago and I'm a writer and I'm a reader and um, I, was, I was looking for writing that, that resonated for me and um, realized that there was no contemporary anthology of, of writers, which I, I think every book that I have edited the impulse has been, I, want, I wanted to edit the book I wanted to read. Um, so I, I'm, I produce a lot of things. Of course, when you edit a book, you read it about 10 times over, but um, the, 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 the desire was to have, um, to bring together these, these contemporary voices. Um, but a lot of my reading be, began with, uh, at the beginning with, in this country anyway, with Audubon and Wilson, and, um, and thinking a lot about how Audubon you know, he was obsessed with nature and, and with art from a young age. The two sort of were married from the beginning. And Wilson, when he arrived in this country, he was more of a poet and then started to draw the birds later. And so sort of thinking about, you know, chicken and egg, you know, does, does the artist find her subject or, um, you know, does, for me, it was definitely, I was a writer and I started to write about birds. And what I found in writing about birds is that, um, I came to understand them better and I could definitely see how, you know, when Christina first started birding, the fact that she, she's an artist, that she saw details that I just didn't see, you know, she would say, you know, did you see the white wing bars? Like, nope, sure didn't, you know, and so I think that, um, I think that uh, the, the, the combination of sort of artist and, and what the artist sees and then what the, what the writer uh, takes from an experience and then writes about it, how that those two things are different, right? So I think with Christina, you were, you were an artist and then you started to draw birds and the writing came after, right? If I'm not wrong. And then with Allison, I'm sort of, I mean, I, your bio says that you were introduced to ducks when you were six. So that kind of did it. Um, <laughs> so maybe, maybe Allison, talk a little bit about that relationship between the birding uh, and the and the um, and the writing, what the writing does to the birding experience, and how that transforms it or solidifies it, or what it what it might do. And if I'm putting you on the spot, we'll make Christina answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Um, so I did start birding when I was six, and essentially my parents took me out looking for ducks. I think that they were just looking for something to do to get me out of the house and they ended up regretting that decision because we looked for a lot of ducks and warblers and gulls and sandpipers after that. Um, and another big part of my life has been storytelling. It's a very, my, mo my whole mom's side of the family are storytellers in one way or another and I definitely got those genes when I was, I guess, eight or nine, I decided that I was going to start a newsletter about nature stories for kids my age in my area that I was friends with. And I had the very original name of Nature Newsletter for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did that for a couple of years. And just the more I wrote and the more that I write, I find that it 
helps me experience the world in a different way than I do if I'm not thinking about how to put it into words. And as I have been writing more and putting those words out into the world, I have noticed that people have also had a different experience of the world from reading my writing. And that to me is something that's really meaningful. I love sharing nature with people in any medium that I can, be it photography or guiding or especially writing. And so it's really two things for me. It is the opportunity to share with other people and also for me to experience in a deeper way than I might otherwise. Um, I was working at Whitefish Point for most of 2019 and 2020. It's on Lake Superior in Michigan and a really important migration site and a migration study site. And part of my work there was writing weekly blogs about the migration counts that I was doing. I did the Waterbird count there. And that really lit a fire under me for just being disciplined in sharing the wonder of birds and the lens that that gives on the world around us with mm -hmm. anybody who will read it. So, and, and how do you, you're a photographer as well. How does the photography fit in with that? Some people are more image oriented than others. For me, I, I don't enjoy taking photos as much as I do writing. I tend to get more caught up in the process of taking the photo and have a more shallow experience and in fact if I'm going to a place for the first time or seeing a bird for the first time I prefer to not take a picture of it because yeah. it it feels like I'm cheating myself a little bit from the experience but yeah. I know that a lot of people might come to my writing from my pictures <laughs> that's been my experience because we are a very image driven culture right now so I just use it as a vehicle to reach a broader audience. That's great. So Christina, your thoughts on the relationship of the art and the writing and in your work and, and what, what the writing does that the, I mean, you've talked a little bit about that already, sort of what the writing can do that the, that the art can't do, but um, how, how did that sort of add, how does that add to your birding experience? Well, I think, uh, I think you actually put into words something that I never quite put into words myself, which is that writing uh, helps me grasp experience over time. Um, so I, I've noticed in, in a lot of my artwork, I'm celebrating an instantaneous moment. And it's, it's in writing that I have the ability to kind of an, to, to analyze my, my own life over a period of time and how that has uh, connected me to many experiences and, and synthesize both uh, my inner world and the outer world. So while uh, it's interesting because at Bard, it was uh, one of the things they taught us in the art department was that you know art is supposed to instill a response from the viewer, but it's up to the viewer to have that response. So after a certain point, I have to kind of let go of contr the control of the, the message I can send. Mm. Um, whereas in writing, I can tell people exactly what I want them to hear mm -hmm. and it uh, in a way it allows me to dig my own personal thoughts even and bring out even more personal thoughts and and tell people things almost in a, a more specific and um, intimate level than I feel like I can do necessarily uh, with a painting so especially in your class um, writing really helped me figure out why this particular bird or, or critter or whatever it was I was writing about actually meant something to me, mm -hmm. as opposed to just uh, jubilantly painting it in, in the, uh, you know, the extreme joy of seeing it in that moment. There, there, I think everyone has, uh, has birds in particular or experiences the natural ones in particular that, that really do stay with them in the long term. And, and those are the things that I mean, they tend to be more powerful paintings, but I think those are the things that actually I've written about because they're just so much more than just here it is, here's the bird, ticket, hooray, it's amazing, it's gorgeous, what a wonderful day. It's like, no, no, my life is different now because this bird really taught me something that's changed everything else. Those are powerful moments. Also, there's the overriding message of you must love vultures. Right. Of course, yeah. that's always <laughs> in case anybody missed that too. 
<laughs> so, I mean, to me, it's just been so great um, hearing both of you read and speak so articulately about this and, and that you have these um, crazy, wonderful dreams of travel and where you're going to go and, and what you're going to do. And um, as somebody who works with young people a lot, I, I, I feel like it's such a gift to um, have that hope. Um, I think especially after the, the, this time that we've been living through, it, that's, that's a challenge. And to know that this, this is what's uh, happening, that there are young people who are just um, having these dreams to me, uh, that, that lets me sleep at night. So um, I hope many of you here have the same feeling. So thank, thank you both my young people for, for, be, for being who you are and as crazy and as talented as you are.